look, you're seeing uh, on your screen the trip planner uh, with the, the map on the left and the tide information on the right. And so for my paddle tomorrow, what I'd like to do is start down here in Richmond, <clears throat> um, right below this yellow pin right below Miller Knox Regional Shoreline, and that's uh, Ferry Point. And I'd like to paddle to China Camp, which is uh, up in the upper left, just above McNear Beach, uh, where this yellow pin here is. And, um, and I can see that, at least in the, uh, out by the brothers, that tomorrow, if we look at the tides over here in the upper right, and the, I'm sorry, the currents, um, we have a, uh, a midday flood, fairly strong, and then we have an afternoon ebb. And um, since I'm kind of lazy, I like to go with the flow, so I'm going to probably launch around noon when it's still flooding pretty nicely and paddle to China camp with the help of the current and hang out there for an hour, maybe an hour and a half or two hours until the current turns around, which I think might happen around 3.15 um, p.m. and then paddle back. So if I go now to um, the measure tab, I can kind of put my, my route in and see how long this will be. So I'll start at Ferry Point and I'll, um, I kind of like to follow the shoreline. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I'll probably do this and head out here toward the brothers. And then I'll uh, cross over <clears throat> to Point San uh, Pablo and continue on to China Camp. So that's uh, about 7.8 nautical miles. So we're talking about 15 or 16 nautical miles round trip. And as long as I've got some current, that's a, a nice day's paddle. So this is what I have in mind. Um, and from the trip planner, we can see a lot of information about the land. Um, let's switch back to the tide view. Um, I can zoom in and, and um, see a lot of features along the shoreline. And I can see yellow pins that represent various uh, put-ins, places where you can land, which is handy. And the blue, blue uh, pins are for current stations and the green pins show me the tide levels. Uh, so we have a midday high tide. Um, but if you look, if you look at the, um, the water, I zoom in on the water, um, I don't see a whole lot. And you might get the idea looking at this picture that these maps were made by people that spend their time on land. And even if I go to the uh, satellite view, once again, if I go into the, the, the Google satellite view, I really don't see much information about what's, what's going on in the water. Um, so a nautical chart is, is, a, is a map that's made for people that spend their time on the water. And so it tries to incorporate the things that are important for people on the water. And so what I would like you to do in the next minute or so is try to come up with a list of five things that you would like to be able to learn from a chart. Um, questions you might want to have answers, features you might like to see. Write those down and then um, uh, I'm going to go back, um, uh, unshare my screen so we can see each other. And then um, uh, perhaps Henry, do you want to manage calling on people? And, and each person can just give one. And I'm going to write these down and we're just going to keep going until we start getting uh, too many duplicates. Uh, and this will give us a sense of what kinds of information do we want to be able to, to learn from a chart. Okay. Cool. If, if you have something to say, please write it in the chat and I'll go ahead and call on you. Or please write your name in the chat. All right. So both Dave and James have mentioned shipping channels. And uh, I'm especially interested in that too, as I paddle through there all the time. Uh, Eric, would you like to join? Eric's right there. Uh, I would like to know how deep the water is in various places. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. 
Steve also mentioned ferry routes, and Beth Kim also mentioned shallow obstacles. Um, I think something else that I'll add in is significant visible land features. Would be nice to know um, what to what to look for when you're on the water. And Mark brought up uh, wind speed and direction, if that would be possible. Um, another one would be that I'm seeing on the chat is forbidden areas. And Steve has buoys for aiming. Hey, Dave, would you like to join the conversation? Uh, yes, magnetic declination, if you're going to use a compass. Compass would be good to know. Probably yeah. a good list for now. And then Jay Simon also mentioned current flow rate. So, Woo. Tom, I think that this might be a pretty ambitious list. <laughs> Can we come up, come up with any more? Anyone have something else they'd like to add? Seal haul out, okay. Yeah, man, you can stop it if you're tired. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could say that. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So I'm going to go back to sharing my. Actually, before I go back to sharing my screen, I'd like to show you one prop that I have. I'll show you how to find this online. But this is called U.S. Chart Number One. Can you see it? So it is a paper book. Okay, and. Um, it's, it's very handy, especially if you're new to charts, um, <clears throat> because it has all the symbols. So if we look at a particular page, you know, here's looking at, at various buoys and marks and lights. Um, and I find that this US chart number one is, is kind of handy for interpreting charts. And I'll show you in a minute where you can find the PDF of it online so you don't have to buy it. But um, um, I encourage you to consider getting one if you think you'll be using charts a lot because it comes in very handy. It's not something you bring in your kayak. It's something you, you study at home. So let me go on now to sharing screen. And um, <clears throat> let's, uh, so on that list, there's, there's some things on there that we're not gonna, gonna be able to get from charts. Um, particularly specifics about currents and wind speed and direction. So those are things that we have to turn to other sources. Um, and seal haul outs, unfortunately, are not marked on charts. Um, there are some of these features that would be nice to add to charts. And, and I believe someone has posted to Buzz an opportunity to learn how to make your own maps that could incorporate chart, incorporate chart information and other things. But let's focus on what the charts can do. So you can do a simple Google search on US nautical charts. And this is what I get. Um, either of these first two choices is good. If I go to uh, NOAA nautical charts, um, <clears throat> the most useful thing is this chart locator here in the upper left. But I want to also point out that um, there are various nautical chart viewers here. Um, there's also a link to US chart number one on the right, uh, where you can download a PDF of it. Um, but let's start with the chart locator. And what comes up is a map of, uh, of the US. And the default is it's showing us electronic charts, ENC. These are electronic nautical charts that you would download into a chart plotter or a GPS. Um, but what we're more interested in tonight are the paper charts. Uh, RNC stands for raster nautical charts. Um, so, and PDF. So this is what we're gonna look at. <clears throat> and to find the chart we need, we just zoom in to our location. So we're in central California and we can zoom in on the Bay Area. And we're seeing all these squares that represent the outlines of various charts. Now the, the paddle I've planned starts here in Richmond and goes up to China Camp. And generally you wanna find the largest scale chart, which means the, uh, that things will look largest, larger on the chart. So the, the one that if I click on this area, I can see this chart 
that covers most of my route, but not all of it. Um, doesn't quite go to China Camp, but it has most of the route. And over on the right, the lower right, it says available products. And what I'm going to choose is the PDF. So this will now open the PDF in my, um, in my browser. And here's the whole chart. Now there's another chart that we need for the, the other part of the route. So let me go back and choose that one. Oops. And that turns out to be called San Pablo Bay. And again, I'm going to download the PDF. Okay, I'm going to try to bring this down a little bit. Um, I'm going to have to resize my window so that I can see all of it because the, okay, that should do. Okay, so here's the chart we want. And if we just look at, um, so I'm going to zoom in. If you have limited bandwidth, you may find that when I move uh, the screen around or zoom in, it may take a little time for your screen to redraw. And I'll, I'll try to pause enough that this can happen. But if we just look at the, um, without a lot of detail, just look at the, the, the broadest information we're seeing from the chart is, is the colors. So land is kind of this beige yellow color. And um, the water is either white or blue. And the green is kind of in between. So that's the intertidal zone along the edges. So at, at low tide, uh, this is going to be exposed. You can't paddle there. And at high tide, it's going to be water. And you can paddle there. Um, and as we zoom in, what we're seeing are these numbers, which represent the depth. And to understand depth, you, you first have to know what the units are. And they aren't the same on all charts. Now in the US, we have not really gone metric yet. So there's two units that are typically used, uh, feet or fathoms. And to find out which it is for your chart, go to the bottom of the chart. And it tells us here in magenta, soundings in feet. Soundings is a word for depth. So the, all these depths are in feet. Now there are other charts. Let's see if I, is this it here? This is a chart, a coastal chart, the, the Gulf of the Farallones, which is the entrance to the Golden Gate, as you can see. And if you go to the bottom of coastal charts, typically what you'll see is something like this. It says, soundings in fathoms. It says fathoms and feet to 11 fathoms. So what does this mean? If I, if I go over to an area of coast here, an area that many of us love to paddle, uh, the Marin Headlands. So we can see that uh, in the areas that are 11 fathoms or more, we're just, we just see the the number of fathoms. But if you, if you look in the blue areas here, we see a large number like seven with a four, a small four next to it. So that means it's seven fathoms plus four feet. So seven times six, a fathom is six feet. Um, so that's 42 plus four is 48 feet. Uh, closer in, we see three fathoms and three feet. So that's uh, 20 feet. Um, so that's, that's a sign that your, your chart is probably in fathoms. But charts in the bay are all, uh, as far as I know, um, in feet. So that's what we'll be using today for this paddle. And let's, um, and let's also <clears throat> look a little bit at the, um, at the colors, the, the white and the blue. So on this chart, the the blue seems to be mostly under 10 or 15 feet in depth. So it's the shallower waters and the white is the deeper waters. 
And this, this pattern is very useful for boaters. Now for most boaters, including ships and yachts and so forth, the white is, is kind of the friendly color and the blue is the danger color. You wanna avoid the blue because you might run aground there. Now kayakers uh, have this almost reversed. We tend to view the blue as the friendly color because we like to go along the shore, it's very scenic, and also we know that um, we're less likely to encounter big ships and boat traffic if we're in the blue water, the shallow water. Um, so we have kind of the perverse view of, um, of the chart. <clears throat> so also look at the land. Um, somebody was asking, what kinds of features can you see on the land? Um, and you'll see that charts are very spotty on the land. A large areas of the land are covered with notes and uh, diagrams and things that are really not helpful for understanding the topography of the land, okay? We don't get much detail on Richmond. But along the coastline, along the shoreline, we do see features uh, that are chosen because you can see them from the water. So if we look at Point San Pablo here, we can see topographic lines showing elevation. We can see that there's a ridge along here. Um, if we go down to Point Richmond, we can see um, there's another ridge here, and there's kind of a, a, um, a gap uh, between Point Richmond and Point San Pablo where the freeway comes through. There's, there's, there's a valley here and a freeway. So these are landmarks we can see from the kayak. Um, also these, these, uh, these tanks, these fuel, these big uh, refinery uh, oil tanks are shown. So that they're marked on the, on the chart as well. So um, there's an attempt to, to show landmarks that you can see from the water um, and to ignore things you can't see from the water. So with that, let's, let's start our paddle. Um, we're gonna be starting uh, here at Point Richmond and Ferry Point, this is the old uh, ferry dock that's in ruins. And the beach that we launch from at Ferry Point is right where my cursor is, right below the words Point Richmond. And uh, when we come out, um, starting our paddle, um, one of the first things we see on the chart here are these devices like this, this green and magenta structure here that says FLG4S and G7. And another one over here that's a, a kind of a red diamond with a, a circle, R6FLR4S. Does anyone know what these might be? I guess people can't. You can write your name in the write your name in the in the thing. We'll call on you in the chat. I'll go for it. Are they buoys? They are buoys. Yeah, these are actually floating navigation marks. Now there are other navigation marks that are not buoys that are not floating. So right down here, this FLR six S. This is a this is a mark that's basically a post. Um, with a uh, red triangle on it. Um, and these, these uh, are navigation marks that are boat ships use to, to uh, avoid going aground or to find channels. And um, there's, there's kind of a, a code. Um, one important thing is in a buoy, which is floating, so it's got this diamond shape. Um, if you see a little magenta circle, that means it's lit at night. So if you were doing this paddle at night, and a lot of John Boshin paddles uh, happen in this area after dark, um, uh, you know that these, these are gonna be marks that tell you where you are, um, and they're lit at night, so you can actually see them. Um, and there is a code for the, for the, uh, the buoy. Um, so if we start with this green one here, uh, the G stands for that it's green, and what you see in quotations is what, what is marked on the buoy. In this case, it's the number seven. Um, 
if we look at this other buoy uh, off to the left, it's, it's R, which stands for red, and it's marked number six. Um, and if we look at this, this post, this other mark here that's not floating, it's, um, it's showing in, in, the quota, in the quotation marks is eight. So it's number eight. So notice we've got a pattern here. We've got the red ones are even numbers. The green ones are odd. And the numbers are increasing as you get closer to port. So we have six, seven, and eight. So if a ship is coming into port, it's, it's seeing these buoys um, in order by their numbers. And then if the buoy is, or the mark is lit, there will be information about how it's lit. So this green, one, green number seven, FL means it's flashing. The G means that the color of the light is green. And four seconds is the period. So every four seconds, there's going to be a flash of green light. And normally, all the buoys within sight in a, in a local area are going to have different light signals. So if we look at this green buoy number five off to the left, it's flashing green, but it flashes every 2.5 seconds. And this red number six buoy is flashing red at four seconds. So the period is the same as this green one, but it's flashing red instead of green. So every buoy has got its own signal at night. Um, and during the day, of course, it's got its color and the number on it that help you identify. So if you get near a buoy or a navigation mark at, during the day, if you look at the, the number on it and look at your chart, you know exactly where you are. And uh, at night, if you look for the, the flashing light pattern and the color, you also will know where you are. Now, the red and green colors um, have a specific meaning. Um, and to understand the meaning, you have to understand uh, the, the channel you're going, that you're in, and which direction it is toward the ocean, and which direction is toward port. And there's a rule called red right returning. And that is that ships that are come returning to port keep the red buoys or the red marks on their right. So red marks on the right when you're returning from sea. So what does it mean here in this channel? We're going to have to zoom out to see the larger picture. So if I have a um, if I have a bulk carrier that's going to load up on scrap steel in the Richmond Inner Harbor, and I come in the gate and I take a left at Angel Island, and I want to go from there to uh, the Inner Harbor here at Richmond, I can't go straight because there's all this blue water that's too shallow for me. Um, so I have to take a left here, follow this channel, and notice that even though we've got a lot of white here, there's this thing called Southampton Shoal that is kind of in the way. You can't get to the entrance channel because of Southampton Shoal. Um, even though it's white, well, here you can see it's 18 feet, and here it's 20 feet, 24 feet. Um, if, you're, if your ship draws 30 feet or 35 feet, uh, you just can't go that way. So you have to take what's called the Southampton Shoal Channel right here. And this is a, a very indirect route. You take the Southampton Shoal Channel in, so you get to this area next to the Richmond Long Wharf, and you make a really sharp right turn to get into the entrance channel. So if you're, if you're returning from sea, you're actually moving um, kind of east in this, in this entrance channel. So all the red buoys and red marks are on your right. Um, so what we can see is that these areas the buoys mark um, are delineating are, are shown as, as, a, as a channel. And you can see this thick dashed line on either side kind of indicates the channel. And in this case, um, these are areas that are dredged. You notice you won't see any depths in the channel itself. It says entrance channel, see tabulation. And elsewhere on the chart, there is a, a, a table showing the um, the control depth for each of these channels, which in this case happens to be 38 feet. So uh, 
all of this channel should be 38 feet deep. So if your ship draws 35 feet, you can actually make it. But you cannot go outside this channel because you can see it's 28 feet right here. And on the other side, it gets down to 15 feet and five feet. So these ships are really restricted. The heavy, the deep water ships are restricted to a very narrow channel. Um, hey Tom, also, I had a question yeah. for you. Yeah. Are the depth numbers that we're seeing here, are they indicating low tide or like when are they? Are they at low tide or are they at high tide or otherwise? That is a really good question. Um, the depth changes over the course of the day. We have like about a six foot tide range most days. So uh, the depth is not constant. And um, the, the, the chart datum, which is the kind of the, the zero point for the chart, is, is what's called mean lower low water, which is a strange term. But if you think about the fact that we each day, we normally have two high tides and two low tides, and they aren't the same. So the two high tides, there's a, a higher high tide, and then there's another high tide that's not quite so high. And then there's the lower low tide, which is the lowest of the day. And then there's another low tide, which is not quite as low. So the, the, the mean lower low tide is basically the average of the lowest tide each day for the year. And so that's the zero. And that's what the, that's what the shoreline is measured from, um, if you look at the edge of the blue here. Um, so when it says um, eight feet deep, that means at, at an average low tide, um, it's eight feet. But of course, at a, at a high tide that's five feet higher, it's going to be 13 feet deep. So the, the depth is going to vary, but um, it's usually best to be aware of what the, what the depth is at low tide, because that's kind of the worst case scenario for most, most vessels. Thank you for that question. Um, so we also see what's called regulated navigation areas, these magenta boxes. So um, let me zoom in on, on one of these regulated navigation areas, 165.1181. So I have a, a question, a multiple choice question here. And the question is, which is true about these regulated navigation areas in this area? Um, I'm going to give you three choices and um, treat them as true false. Uh, there could be one right answer, there could be three right answers, there could be no right answers. So if, if, if you think it's true, please raise your hand. Okay, the first is human powered vessels are not allowed in regulated navigation areas. So raise your hand if you think that's true. The second is, ships must not exceed 15 knots in these regulated navigation areas. Raise your hand if you think that's true. And the third is, large ships greater than 1,600 gross tons must not pass, cross, or meet each other in these regulated nav navigation areas. If you think that's true, raise your hand. Okay, Henry, what was the vote for uh, the first choice? Human powered vessels are not allowed. It was a false. So, okay, and the falses have it. Uh, there is no restriction. Human powered vessels are allowed in these regulated navigation areas. Not all of them, but these. Okay. The second one, ships must not exceed 15 knots in these RNAs. That was mostly true. Very good. That is true. Ships must are limited to 15 knots. Now you'll never see, in these tight areas, you'd never see a ship going that fast. Um, but that's generally true of all regulated navigation areas in the bay. The third one, large ships must not pass, cross, or meet each other in these areas. This one was very, uh, it was, 50 -50. I thought 50-50, so there's been a debate. About 50-50, yeah. So um, it turns out that that's true for the, um, the Richmond channels and this, um, this Southampton Shoal channel. 
So if there's, if there's a tanker coming out and a tanker coming in, they're not allowed to uh, cross or pass each other in the channel. Or if there are two coming in, one cannot pass the other. Um, it's, there are other regulated navigation areas in the bay where this is not the case, but in this one, that is the case. Um, and if you want to know what the specific rules are for one of these regulated navigation areas, you can use this number, 165.1181. If you Google on regulated navigation area, 165.1181, you can either get um, the information from a .gov website, or there's actually a Cornell uh, law site that has good information on them. Um, it's a bit tedious reading, but, but you will get the information there. You can look it up. Um, it's not useful on your kayak, but when you're studying the chart and planning your trip, you might want to do that. Okay. So, I had a question for you. Yeah. Um, there was a question regarding the 15 knots. Specifically, is doesn't the 15 knot rule depend on the specific type of ship? And I think what's happening is Steve thinks he can paddle 15 knots. And he's getting a little bit worried about it. <laughs> um, <coughs> this rule actually is for for ships, not for small vessels. So you could see a speedboat go by, you know, a yacht go by at fifteen, at uh, twenty knots. That would not be forbidden. Um, it's it's <coughs> it's really the ships. Tom. Uh, yeah. I thought I read that it's specifically for ships carrying compressed natural gas regulations. In some areas, that's true. Um, you have to look up the specific number. And this number actually applies to a lot of different areas in the Bay. And then it will have, um, <coughs> it will have some rules that are general for all of them and others that are specific for individual areas. And it will, it will indicate which areas. So um, although we are not forbidden from paddling in a ship channel or regulated navigation area, we do have some restrictions. And that is that when we're in these, paddling in or crossing these channels, we are not allowed to interfere with vessels that have deep draft and are restricted to those channels. Um, these big ships, especially if you look at the narrower channels like Southampton Shoal, this is a very narrow channel, and they cannot turn and go outside of it. And big ships can't stop quickly. Um, there's not much they can do to avoid you, and we are not allowed to interfere with their traffic. So they have the right of way in those areas, and we have to be very careful not to interfere with their, um, their travel. <clears throat> so I'd like to um, ask about a couple of navigation marks over here that seem a little peculiar. This uh, Q that says 23 feet, this one right here, and the one to the lower right of it called ISO 6S 36 feet. I'm gonna ask another multiple choice questions. What do these two lighted marks mean? A, vessels should keep these marks on the right returning to the Richmond entrance. How many are, think that's true? Raise your hand. Okay, B, the dashed line between them marks a sewer outfall pipe. Raise your hand if that's true. The third one, uh, C, vessels entering the Richmond entrance channel should keep these two marks lined up. And D, Vessels should follow the dashed line to land to find the nearest Starbucks. So it turns out there's only one true answer to this question. So uh, Henry, how did we do? We did pretty well. There were, um, the most trues were on the, I believe it was number three, which was the lineup. Um, okay, that it, was the one correct one. 
How about the others? Were there any that were uh, in favor of the other three? The other, there was one, uh, there were a couple votes for keeping the buoys on the right side when you're returning. Um, but the, I think that was really the only one. Okay. So um, if you look at the code here, this Q refers to the light. It means quick flashing, which quick, quick flashing in navigation life means roughly once a second. And 23 feet is the height of the mark. Um, the other one says ISO, which stands for ISO phase which means the light is on and off for the same length of time. And the period of that is six seconds. So it's on for three seconds, off for three seconds, on for three seconds, off for three seconds. And it's 36 feet high. Now it's not obvious from these symbols, but these represent range markers. And if you follow this dashed line, so I'm gonna zoom out. Come on, okay. What you can see here, is that the dashed line extends to become the center line of this entrance channel. So if a ship is coming in this channel and they see these two markers, which are posts out here, um, they actually have symbols on them that are uh, white vertical stripes with orange on either side. And if they see one, the taller one is in back and the shorter one is in front. If they see them superimposed one above the other, then they're in the middle of the channel. And they, if they do that, um, they'll be in the channel, of course, until they get here. If they go too far, they're going to run aground. Um, and they've got to know from the buoys where they need to make their left turn. And there's actually another range uh, on the far right here. Um, these two at the end of Point Potrero Reach that mark uh, this channel. So these are range markers that ships use. <clears throat> so now um, we want to get to. Oh, by the way, those who might have thought there was a sewer line, this is a sewer line right here. This, this line represents a sewer line, and there are two buoys here that uh, show where that sewer line runs. And the city of Richmond does not want ships anchoring and damaging their sewer lines. So they have this, this is marked on the chart. Now, if I uh, follow my paddle plan and I come out of Ferry Point and I want to avoid all these all the ship traffic, so I'm going to follow the shoreline here, and uh, I'm going to come by uh, Point Richmond and wave to Johnny Worby as I go by. He lives up here in the hill somewhere, and Sally lives up there as well. And then I'll just cross under the uh, the Richmond Long Wharf here, uh, which is the, just a big pier. That's where the the oil tankers unload. Does anyone see a problem with this route? Actually, Pauline, do you see a problem? I see a problem. Um, we live in Point Richmond, so this is right outside my house. Yeah. There's a security zone. Yeah, so security zone. Um, this is a case, this security zone, this 165.1197, if you look that up, you'll find that all of the, um, the tanker uh, oil piers in the Bay Area have a security zone around them. It's uh, 100 feet uh, from, from the pier, and uh, no one is allowed um, in these um, without specific authorization by the captain of the Port of San Francisco. And good luck getting that. They do not want us going anywhere near these, these uh, oil piers. Um, so it's really unfortunate because it would really be nice to just cut through and go along the shoreline, but we can't. So, <coughs> so now I have to figure out how to get to the Richmond Bridge without getting run over by a ship. So let's look at, at this area. So I want to get from Ferry Point in the lower right to the Richmond Bridge, and I want to minimize the amount of time that I spend in the ship channels. Um, so I'd like, I'd like you to spend just a minute thinking about how you would, what route you might take, especially if there were a lot of ships uh, going in and out um, to avoid, uh, avoid ship traffic, stay out of their way. How can you minimize the time you spend? And um, when you have an idea, why don't you put it in the chat and Henry will call on you.
clarify it for everybody. I can tell you how I did it, which was wrong. I think I followed the entrance channel and took a diagonal through the regulated navigation area. Okay. But I maximized my time there, which right. was a good learning experience. <laughs> And that's okay if, if there's no ship traffic, you know, that's, that's allowable. Anyone else want to say what they think that you should do? Should they write their name in the chat? Yeah, you can write your name in the chat. We have a response, but I can call on him if you want. Sure. Hey, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to suggest uh, heading west to cross the Southampton Shoal Channel and um, go, you know, to the west of the shipping channel okay. and then head north. So where would you cross the, um, the entrance channel? Or Could you zo point? zoom out a little bit? Let me see. Uh, so let me just move it a bit. Oh, yeah, you know, between the closest two blue parts. <laughs> okay, so over here somewhere? Yeah. Okay. And then where would you cross the Southampton Shoal Channel? You know, I'd probably do it near the marks so I'd know where I was. Right. Like the so, G number three there, or, or if you were further north, the five, you know. Probably so the, the three. G number three yeah. or the G number five. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Jonathan's come up with some strategies here. One is he's going to cross the ship channels where they're narrow and basically kind of at right angles to minimize the time. And if you cross near the buoy, then you know exactly where the channel is. Because if you're in the middle between two buoys, it's kind of vague. You don't really know exactly where that channel is. There's no dashed lines on the water that show you the channel. The buoy is all you got. So if you pick a buoy that at a narrow point in the channel and cross there, that's less than a tenth of a mile. So at three knots, that's, you're going to do that in less than two minutes. So your time in the channel is very short. And again, crossing the Southampton Shoal Channel, you can be across in two minutes. And if you stay, um, Mark, yeah, I had a comment. If you wouldn't mind, you can unmute her. Um, never mind. I just picked a series of buoys that I could use to keep track of where I am in that impossible maze out there. But uh, you're already going there. Okay. Yeah, so, so there are ways to, to deal with these channels um, and it really helps to use the buoys and to understand uh, from the chart, if you're looking for red number six, um, when you get out in this area, if you find a red number six, you know you're on the edge of the Southampton Shoal Channel. Whereas if you find yourself near red number two, you know, oh, this is not the Southampton Shoal Channel. So let me zoom in so you can see that. Um, red number two, so the number on the buoy really helps you know exactly where you are if you do not have a GPS on your deck, okay? So that's a great way to, to, get, uh, to get to the Richmond Bridge. And um, <clears throat> somebody mentioned seal haul outs. Um, these are not marked on the chart, but this Castro rocks here in the center, these rocks that are right below the Richmond Bridge, these are the second um, biggest seal haul out, seal pupping areas on San Francisco Bay. So this is pretty much a no-go area for us. We, we stay away from Castro Rock. So even though it would be really nice to paddle back in here, um, we avoid it. Um, so let's uh, zoom out a bit and uh, think about as we cross under the Richmond Bridge, where can we expect boat traffic. Um, so as you may know, uh, most of the most of the big ships are going to be using the main ship channel, which is on the west side of Red Rock. So here's Red Rock. And to the left of it, this is the main shipping channel. So here's a, 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 a red buoy number 14 that marks the the right side of the channel as, as a ship is going uh, going away from the ocean. Um, and here's a green buoy just north of the bridge, this uh, uh, number 15, that's the left side. So we can see the channel here. Um, then it gets a little bit less distinct because we've got lots of deep water here. 
And it isn't until we get up to Whiting Rock and Invincible Rock, you can see it's eight feet and 15 feet, um, which we can paddle over fine, but the big ships, they don't want to go there. So we've got a, a red buoy um, number 16 and a red buoy number 18 here. So this kind of marks the, the right side of the channel. So we're not going to see big ships in this area just south of Brothers. Now someone asked about ferry routes. Turns out this dashed line here with the arrows um, is actually the route for the Vallejo Ferry. Now it doesn't keep real close to that route, but the ferry going towards Vallejo does go inside the Brothers, to the east of the Brothers. Um, and if you follow this, this line, you'll see references to, um, well, ferry route, C note F, um, which just tells you that there are ferries that take these routes. Um, so there are some ferry routes that are marked on the chart, but ferries don't stick very closely to their routes, so be aware of that. Also, smaller vessels like tugboats and other work vessels are not restricted to the, the deep water channels, so they, they often take other routes. Now, what about um, following the shoreline here? Um, many of us like to uh, stop or launch at um, Point Miladi Beach Park, which is located right here. It just opened about um, four or five years ago after being closed for many years. But notice this restricted area here, um, which is quite puzzling. Um, and I looked up the, uh, the number and this 334.1090. And it says persons and vessels not operating under supervision of the local military or naval authority or public vessels of the United States shall not enter this area except by specific permission of the commanding officer naval supply center. Last amended 1997. So this is about this pier at Point Milotti, which used to be a refueling pier for the Navy. But it hasn't been in use for more than 25 years. Now I noticed Don Fleming was logged in. Don, do you have any stories about uh, entering this restricted area and getting in trouble? Don, unmute yourself. Don, you're muted. Hey, Don, you're muted. Perfect. Perfect. I, I've never heard of anybody having any trouble over in this restricted area. The Navy's been out of here for so long, it's immaterial. And I've gone under this pier a whole bunch of times. They, I don't think they use it here anymore. Okay. I, I do recall at one point hearing some old timer in Basque um, telling me that they had, uh, they had been uh, warned away when they tried to cross under this, under this pier. But in the 10 years that I've been paddling this area, um, I've never encountered a problem. And we actually launch at Point Melody Beach Park, which is inside the restricted area. So this does not seem to be enforced. And this is one um, you can pretty safely ignore. But it, it is still on the books. OK, so. Um, <clears throat> So as we continue up and, and um, we get to the brothers, notice that there's a, uh, a lighthouse there. It says flashing five seconds. 61 feet is the height of the light above the water. 14M stands for the, the uh, distance you can see it from in good visibility. And M stands for miles, actually nautical miles. So you, if it's clear, you should be able to see this from 14 nautical miles away. And horn means it's got a fog horn, although it's, mainly, it's active October 1 to April 1. Um, Tom, I had a follow-up question for you on what sure. you were mentioning earlier. Um, okay. What is the date on this specific chart? And then also, how often are these maps updated? So um, I'm not going to zoom out and zoom down to it because it, it's a bit cumbersome. But if you look in the lower left of the chart, it will give you that information. And I believe that the, the chart was updated, I think in terms of the features in 2012, but um, 
changes to um, uh, data on the chart were updated uh, in, I think, April of this year. So when you download a PDF from the Coast Guard, from the, uh, the Coast Guard website, the government website, a NOAA website, um, it will have the latest information available. Now, a lot of the soundings that are taken, the depths might be pretty old, and it will sometimes give you information on the chart in certain areas, you know, when were the surveys done for those depths. But information about lights and buoys and Navigation information should be up to date as of April of this year. So it should be very current. Okay. So um, let's uh, continue from the brothers across San Pablo Strait. Um, now we have a pretty wide uh, shipping area here. Um, so this is this is an area that where you don't really know quite where the ships are going to be, you really got to keep a good lookout. Um, once you get over in this blue area, though, you're, you're, you're safe. Now, as we approach Point San Pedro, we see all these funny symbols, the, all these lettered things. Um, these are, um, I'm going to ask another, uh, another question, three choices. Um, these bathtub-shaped symbols represent A, Shipwrecks submerged at low tide. How many think it's true? B, mooring balls. How many think it's true? C is boater hot tubs for rent by the hour. So there was um, most of the votes went for B. For true false, oh, there right. were a couple of votes for A. Okay, uh, actually, the B is the only correct answer. These are are mooring buoys that are used by uh, mostly by barges that are picking up rock. There's a rock quarry over here at Point San Pedro, which um, really ought to be marked on the chart, but I, it isn't really shown. Um, and so these are huge mooring buoys. They're not really suitable for kayaks, um, and barges will, will tie up there. Um, and one nice thing about these, you know that, they, that ships are not going to come through here because uh, they'd have to play uh, you know, dodgeball with, the, with these mooring buoys, and the currents are often pretty strong. So this is also another safe area for kayakers. Now as we go up toward the sisters, I'm going to zoom in here. There's a couple of symbols asterisks and the plus sign, which are very useful to know. An asterisk is a, uh, a rock that um, is visible at low tide, but covered at high tide. So it's kind of intertidal. And so if you're at high tide, uh, you might run into this rock or a wave might drop you on the rock. A plus sign is a rock that is below the low tide level. So below the zero tide level. Um, but it's close enough to the surface that it could be a problem. And I call this the Lee Coleman rock because I was paddling with Lee Coleman about, I don't know, five or six years ago in his beautiful wooden kayak that he'd built himself and a wave dropped him on this rock and actually put a hole in his boat. So that, that rock is, is firmly etched in my mind. And you can find these rocks on the chart and not have to hit them with your boat. Um, now at this point, as we head north, we're kind of reaching the end of our chart. And this is where we need to switch to that San Pablo Bay chart. Now this um, San Pablo Bay chart is a one to 40,000 scale. The chart we were looking at is a one to 20,000 scale. So things are gonna look smaller on this chart and there's gonna be a little bit less detail. So if I zoom in, I'm not gonna see quite as much detail here on these rocks. Um, but we now can see the, we can look and see all of San Pablo Bay. I zoom out. What's most obvious is it's a really blue. It's all really shallow. And there's only a very narrow channel going to Vallejo. And of course, this channel also goes to uh, Benicia and it goes all the way to Sacramento. There are big ships that go all the way to Sacramento or Stockton. So this is an important um, shipping route. And this area um, 
I can zoom in here, the narrow section here called the Pinole Shoal Channel um, is a very unusual regulated navigation area. If you look this up, um, it's the only one I know of where uh, the only boats allowed to use this channel are large vessels um, greater than 1,600 tons. Um, and other vessels that are less than 1,600 tons are not allowed to use the channel and they're not even allowed to cross the channel. So that's why if you look at the ferry routes, they go outside this channel. They do not use the shipping channel. Um, so that's an area we do have to be careful of. Just this very narrow section here is off limits. Um, we also have a safety zone up here, um, which is kind of peculiar. If you look this one up, this is a, a Coast Guard um, zone for testing, let's see, what is the terminology? Um, use of force training. I don't know if that's firing weapons or what, but uh, they use it two to six times a month. And when they're using it, um, it is off limits to all vessels. Um, fortunately, that's not an area we're likely to be kayaking. Um, so the rest of our route to China Camp is, is pretty straightforward. We're in this shallow water that's pretty safe. If you look here at China Camp, you can see the pier sticking out. And notice that um, this green zone, the intertidal zone, extends most of the way out the pier. So at a zero tide, most of this is exposed. And in fact, those of you who have tried paddling there at a zero tide know this is, this is really thick mud that's uh, really miserable to, uh, to get across. Um, and of course, at a minus one foot or two foot tide, it, it would be out even further. So fortunately, I'm planning to get there at high tide. It won't be a problem. So um, let's see. I think that's kind of what I had planned to cover along the route. What I'd like to do now is just show you some ways that we can get, um, get charts on our deck. And so I'm going to stop screen sharing. And um, you might want to set your speaker, your, uh, your view to speaker view so that you can see me larger. It's up to you. Um, make this full screen. So there are various options for bringing a chart on your kayak. The one that I've used for years, and my charts are pretty old, is to buy a chart book. And you can buy these in marine supply stores or online. Like West Marine carries them, but you can order them online. This happens to be by MapTech. It's called a waterproof chart book of San Francisco Bay and the Delta. So it, it covers everything. And um, now, as you can see, I have, I have cut most of the pages out because uh, the book is too big to fit on my kayak deck and the, the paper isn't really sturdy enough to use on your kayak deck. It's waterproof, but um, it's pretty thin. So what I do is put, I, I fold up the maps and put them in a chart, a transparent chart case that is kind of a Ziploc uh, closure. And um, I try to fold the chart so that I can see the, the area that I'm gonna be paddling that day. Um, and this works reasonably well. Um, more recently, what I've been doing on trips like to Vancouver Island, where actually you can't, um, you can't download PDFs of the Canadian charts for free. They don't, they don't, you have to buy the paper charts or pay a lot of money for electronic charts. So I actually buy the paper charts, take them to a photocopy place and make 11 by 17 copies of areas that are of interest. And then I use a laminator, the same sort of thing that restaurants use to make menus. You know, remember, we used to go to restaurants and sit down and they bring you a menu. And, um, and this really protects them quite well. And I have a laminator. I think Jim and Margo have one. There's a Basque one. So it's pretty easy to borrow a laminator and make your own charts. And these 11 by 17 charts fit nicely on your deck under the bungees. Um, so this is a great way to do it. The one awkward thing is that if you want to have um, 
a compass rose in a scale, the section you photocopy probably doesn't have that. So you'll have to, um, you may want to actually make your own compass rose or, and, and paste it on there. Um, and also the same with the scale. Um, so those are modifications you might want to do. Another way to get a chart on your deck is to buy a marine GPS. Um, Garmin has one kind of marine GPS. We have a couple of these. Um, Frank asked before the session began what model I prefer. Um, I have two models that differ. One of them has the electronic compass, and I don't find much difference between the one with the compass and the one without. The, the only difference is that the one with without the compass will not show you compass directions unless you're moving. Uh, one with the electronic compass, um, you can be stationary and it will show you the compass directions. Um, but you can buy, the important thing is to get the charts in these. And with the Garmin GPSs, if you want the NOAA charts, you kind of have to pay them for to either have them in memory or on a chip that you insert into the GPS. Um, and uh, one of these that, that I bought bundled with the chip actually has all of the Canadian as well as US charts in the memory. And so wherever I am, that's what's showing on the screen. So that's pretty handy. But these days you don't need to buy a special GPS because most of us are carrying a different kind of GPS called a cell phone, it has GPS in it. You can download apps like Navionics or iNavX, which are like chart plotter apps. And um, you can download charts into the memory. And so you can see them. If you have a waterproof case for your phone, you can use that on your deck. So these are all options for bringing a chart along. And I used to almost always have a chart on my deck when I went paddling, although a lot of the routes I do routinely, I've stopped carrying the chart, but I always have the GPS. But um, I do find it's handy uh, if I want to know where a particular buoy is or look for a specific channel marker, um, it's easy to do from the chart, easier than it is from the, from the GPS. Um, there were some questions earlier about use of a compass. Let's see how it's getting, it's uh, eight ten. So I've been going about an hour, which is uh, kind of what I promised Henry I would I would try to keep it to. So um, I'd like to open it up for questions, if people have specific questions. Um, if people want to learn a little bit about the, the, the compass on, in the chart, use, use of a compass with the chart, I can go into that a little bit. Um, or if you have other questions, I'm happy to take them now. I think uh, let's, let's answer a couple questions and then we can uh, see if someone asks a question about the compass and we'll we'll go from there. Uh, I think the first question that we have is regarding the Castro rocks and the seal hall out. Um, what how far do you normally stay away from that? Um, so Castro rocks is not a, a marine protected area officially. Um, so so the issue really is um, that you, you shouldn't disturb the seals. And um, I think there are some guidelines that you should stay like 300 feet away from the seals. The, the problem is, is not seals in the water, the problem is seals that are hauled out. Um, and they are very easily spooked. Um, and, it's, and especially if, if they have pups, um, it, it's really, well, it, it's against the law to disturb them, but it's also bad for them to disturb them. Um, they haul out of the water to partly to stay warm um, and also to avoid predators like great white sharks. So, um, so I think that the general guideline is 300 feet, but the more important thing is if you see them putting their heads up and looking at you and looking alarmed, um, then it's time to, to move farther out um, because the next thing they're going to do is start galloping toward the water in, in, as much as a seal can gallop. Cool, thank you. Um, one question about the chart was, does the chart include the VHF channel used to turn on the foghorn? And does that question make sense? I'll be honest, I didn't know what the words meant, but. 
I believe it sounds like you can radio the foghorn to turn it on. Um, I'm not aware of that. Uh, that was mine. Um, Tom, I, I saw that on a, on a chart. I was, where was I? I was um, on the San Mateo coast. Um, and I noticed on the, on the nautical chart where the land is, there was a note that said, um, ping, uh, I think it was channel 84, three times with your VHF radio, and it will turn on the, f the automatic foghorn on that range of coast for like 30 minutes or something like that. So it's really handy if you happen to be paddling somewhere where fog comes in really quickly. And it was, I had never seen it before, but I happened to notice it on that, on that one chart. That's really cool to, to hear about. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, every chart has a bunch of notes on it. And that's mostly on the places that are, that are land, like Richmond. You know, there were all these notes, notes A, B, C, D, E, F. And the notes are different on different charts. So I have not seen those, that note on the Bay Area charts. But on the coastal charts, obviously you, you saw that note and that's great to know and something I, I should look for um, in looking at charts. Uh, thank you. Sure. I just put a link in it uh, in the chat for that. There was a question, uh, two questions on the chart symbols. The first was there was a squiggly red line on the chart that was kind of near the navigation sense channel that was going towards San Pablo. The first question is which one's that one? And then the second question was there's a black dashed line inside of a red dashed line near the channel at the bridge. And we were wondering what that meant. So the, the squiggly magenta line is a, a cable. Um, sometimes you'll see the squiggly red line which will show the actual root of a cable. And in other cases you'll see um, a rectangular area outlined with a, a, a dashed magenta line, it will say cable area. So there might be multiple cables, like between Angel Island and Tiburon, there are some cable areas. And that means, and that's really not too important for kayakers, it's more for boats who might want to anchor. And they should, they're not allowed to anchor near a cable because they could snag the cable and, and break it. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's a good question, but um, it's more relevant to people in, in larger boats that might be dropping anchors. Uh, the second uh, then the next question was black dash line inside of red dash line, sea channel the bridge. Uh, Steve, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, and maybe you covered it and I missed it. But if you if you go back looking at where the um, navigation channel crosses the Richmond Bridge. There, there's the dotted, there's the dashed red or magenta line designating the sides of the channel. And then inside is a black dashed line that's narrower. And, and I'm, I'm guessing from what you said about the black dashed line further up is that's the deeper part of the, of the sh channel for big ships. So, um the, the dashed red lines are used for many purposes on the chart. And so you need to be careful in looking at the chart to figure out what does this red dashed line look for. Um, so it's used for outlining regulated navigation areas. It's also used for outlining safety zones, prohibited zones, um, general anchorage areas, um, areas for anchoring if you have explosives on board, um, there's all kinds of things that those red dash lines are used for. So you really, you, what you should do is look for the, the red dash line will be part of a large rectangular or, or some kind of a multi-sided area and look near the center of that and you'll see a magenta um, label or you might see several of them, but um, it's hard to get, you know, it, it's, um, in that area, there aren't always marked channels. Um, there'll be some buoys, but it's, it's so big, it's not a dredged narrow channel the way we see going into Richmond or uh, Southampton Shoal Channel. Yeah, but my question was, if, if, can you put the chart back up for a second at the bridge? Can yeah, you, you still... 
and that'll make it easy. If you put it right at the bridge where the channel crosses the bridge, uh, so if you can scroll. Down. Let's see, is this the right chart? I forget. Um, it it's might funny, go down. Doing this on Zoom, it all happens more slowly. <laughs> you have to share your I did, but it's it's not zooming out. Huh. Well, well even here. This, uh, okay, good. This is the wrong chart. You're getting there. Um, no, that's it's the wrong yeah. chart. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. Okay, so is it the main channel you're talking about? This one here. Channel, the main channel. Okay, good. There. Okay, so oh, there. So this the, right, the black dashed lines indicate the channel here, south of the bridge. Um, and of course, north of the bridge, they don't continue. Um, so there's a lot of dashed lines here. <laughs> so there's a ferry route one here. Um, and then there's uh, this one and this one here. So to understand what those are, I'm going to zoom out. Um, we had just had a comment that uh, the black dash lines indicate the dredged portion of the channel. Yeah. Does that right. sound right? Um, in uh, certainly in the, um, I'm not sure if it's always the case. W one thing I did see in chart number one is that the dashed line means that um, n along the dashed line is, is the edge of the channel and the depths there might be some shoaling along the edges of the channel. So that would imply it is dredged and that it, it tends to fill in over time. Um, so it does appear that on the right side that this dashed magenta line does indicate a, a regulated navigation area, probably. Yeah, this regulated navigation area 165.1185. Um, I think that's what this dashed line represents. Um, and then this, this solid line here uh, is indicating general anchorage number five. Um, so it's, it's inside all of these buoys. So this is not the shipping channel, but it is an anchorage. Um, and then here's a forbidden anchorage inside this, this circle. Um, and the small circle is anchorage for explosives. Um, and it's another dashed magenta line. Um, and it, so the forbidden anchorage is only when there are vessels anchored with explosives in here. So it's. Okay, so Steve, that's the best I could do with your question there. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, there's the black lines that were confusing me, but I, I think, as you're saying, it's either dredged or, and if it's dredged, I assume, they guarantee that's sort of the deepest part of the channel. And you see it only exists in certain stretches. Right. So yeah. Maybe the areas yeah. that are more shallow or, or problematic. Yeah, that's, that's probably it, yes. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you mentioned that you had the, the charts on Google Earth. Do you have the, is have, that easy for you to show everyone or? Yeah, both on my screen. If you want to let me share my screen for a second, I'll show you another alternative for charts. That's kind of nice. Yeah, I think it's up. I, I think it, or I think you should be able to share. Okay. Uh, Okay. Okay. So just to show you, you can get an overlay from NOAA for Google Earth that has all the NOAA charts. And then you can selectively download whichever chart you want. Don't try to do them all at once because it'll take forever. Uh, and you can download them either in a collared or a color colorless version. And the nice thing about the colorless version is it seamless going from one chart to another. So if you happen to be paddling in an area where you're crossing two charts, 
you can get exactly what you want printed out and make it waterproof or put it in a waterproof case. So I'm sort of zooming in here just to show you, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, you can see that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, you can go way in and see all the same stuff we were looking at. Uh, so that's, and you can even, um, let's see if I can do it. You can even make them semi, let me go up here, uh, semi-transparent or transparent if you want to see some of the land features and the chart at the same time, although that gets kind of confusing. Um, and uh, I think what Thomas talked about also before is, I think you can see where the scale changes uh, between the two charts. Let's see if I'll show it here. And Steve, you can get that. You go on NOAA basically and you download the ENC file. Is that correct? I posted how to do it uh, a couple of years ago on Buzz. So if you go to the Buzz archives and you just kind of look for Google Earth NOAA charts, it'll give you the instructions. There's a whole video that shows you how to do it. It's a little bit complicated to set up initially, but then it, it works really nicely. So it's, it's I, I really like it because I can just say I want to paddle, you know, from uh, Ferry Point to Angel Island. I just want to go into that specific area. You know, I can awesome. center on my screen and then, you know, uh, well, this one I have to I have to zoom in a little bit more to get detail, and it's it's real easy to zoom in and out if you want to get the overview, and you can get the whole the whole coast. No, that's that's Sorry. perfect. And uh, Dave posted in the chat a link of how to how to do it if you're interested. We got two more questions. It goes to a dead link on the NOAA site, but it's at least it's a start. If the yeah. The dead link, it's explained in the post that I put up on Buzz, uh, how to get around that dead link. Um, and I think Jim Ham had figured it out. So uh, it's it works. It's awesome. Um, we got two more questions. Uh, the first question is, it's how do you, how or where do you cross the Pinal Channel? And my recollection is, Tom, you said you couldn't pass the Pinal you couldn't cross the Pinal Channel, so I guess where 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 can we cross? Is that or do I have that wrong? Um, let me go back to share screen. Um, find that chart. So that would be this one. So if you, um, if you look up the, uh, the regulated navigation area, this 165.1181, uh, um, it, it will normally, th th these named regions like Pinole Shoal Channel um, are delineated by magenta lines. So I'm guessing that in the upper right, this line here, represents the edge, the end of that Pinole Shoal channel. Um, at the other end of uh, the channel, I'm not sure Is exactly. Is where these black lines end? Uh, that could be, that's probably it. I'm guessing it's from these two buoys right here to uh, this buoy up here. That's the section that we aren't allowed in. Um, further, Further down, it's okay. And further up toward Vallejo, it's okay. But this is the section. And you can see that's the part that's dredged, that's very, very narrow. The distance between these buoys, um, very tight. There was a one last question uh, for you um, regarding the compass, using the compass with the chart. Is there a way for you to do a quick, a quick version of that? Um, well, one thing I should do is point out the compass rows uh, on, on the chart. Um, so charts will have compass roses. Um, <clears throat> and 
there's an outer circle and an inner circle and is with with compass directions um, the the circle is divided up into 360 degrees so zero degrees is is north 90 degrees is east 180 is south 270 is west and the charts are generally printed so that true north is straight up so true north means pointing toward the the, the geographic north pole um, most of us use magnetic compasses and they don't point to the geographic north pole they point to the magnetic north pole which is not exactly in the same place and uh, depending on where you are in the world there will be a, a deviation between the true north and the magnetic north so this inner circle represents the magnetic compass rose and you can see here in the center it tells you what the variation is on a certain date um, and this was in 2011 um, magnetic north was 14 degrees and 15 minutes east of true north so this this arrow here this magnetic arrow that's um showing 14 degrees 15 minutes on the, the true uh, compass rose now it does change with time so it says annual decrease is uh six minutes so each year it's going to drop by six minutes um, and actually that decrease is not very steady um, and it's actually rather hard to predict so if you really want an accurate number you'd have to look online and find out what it is currently um, but for for kayaking purposes we don't really care about minutes <laughs> uh, and even a degree or two really doesn't matter because when you're steering with a compass on your deck you're lucky like lucky to get within five degrees of where you're where you're trying to go so if we figure roughly 15 degrees that that's close enough um, and um, I probably also should have mentioned scales of distance on the chart. Um, the chart, every chart will have a scale someplace on it. Uh, this one, let's see, where is it? It's in the upper left here. If I can zoom in on this. Oh, come on. There we go. So here's the scale in uh, nautical miles statute miles and yards um, but another way to get a scale on a chart is to look at the minutes of latitude so along the left and right sides of the chart you will see um, the latitude and if i go down to the bottom you'll see the number of degrees oh here's 38 degrees so we are 38 degrees north of the equator with uh, the north pole being at 90 degrees and um, and then it's marked in minutes. So um, here's five minutes. So that was four, 38 degrees, four minutes, 38 degrees, five minutes. And it turns out that in latitude, one minute of latitude equals one nautical mile. So if you go to the left or right side of the chart, you'll be you'll have a scale. This is a one nautical mile. And that's one of the reasons for that, that really sets the length of a nautical mile is one minute of latitude um, and this actually comes in pretty handy um, that's awesome so i would say so for um let me go off of screen sharing and let's see what you may want to do is go to speaker view and um, what I use for navigating with a chart is, um, let's see if I can demonstrate this. So here, here's a laminated chart, and this is Vancouver Island. And um, so if I want to plot a course, let me see if I can aim this down. So if I want to plot a course, I use this tool called a parallel rule. So it looks like uh, two rulers that are connected with little arms. And um, so I will plot a course and you can use 
you can write on a laminated chart with either a, a grease pencil, and these will write even on wet surfaces, so this is handy. And you can erase a grease pencil just with like with a tissue or something or a cloth, you can rub it off. And the other option is to use a, a Sharpie, a waterproof Sharpie. And a waterproof Sharpie can be washed off with alcohol. Um, it has to, 70% rubbing alcohol will not do it, but 90% will. So you can carry a little bottle of, of alcohol to clean your chart if you wish. But anyway, um, you can simply uh, use a straight edge to draw a particular course that you would like to take on your chart, say to get to a particular point. So I'm going from, uh, from this point to this point and um, use the, the parallel rule. I can line the rule up here with this line and then I have to have a compass rose, which I have right here, or there's one printed over here. And you use the parallel rule to walk the, um, walk the line over to the, um, to the compass rose, to the center of the compass rose. And so now I have a, a line going through the center of the compass rose, and I can read the, um, the course in degrees, which in this case ends up being about um, 316 degrees. Um, and my compass rose I put on the chart using the magnetic um, direction, not the true north, but the magnetic north. So now I have a course which I can write so I can write 316 degrees um, on my chart. And so I would do this before I would go on the paddle. I'd have this on my deck. And if the fog rolls in while I'm paddling, I have the option of um, following my compass um, to, to find my, to get to my uh, destination. Um, I mean, there are, there are, this isn't a navigation class, so there's lots of things you can do with um, uh, taking bearings and um, uh, plotting courses um, and uh, headings. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not really prepared tonight to go into a lot of that, but that's just kind of a really rough introduction of, of how you can use a, a, a chart to give you headings to follow, especially if, if you're, you know, in thinking about chart reading, and one of the reasons that we see very few kayakers using charts in the bay is because of where we live. Um, anywhere you are in the bay, we have these amazing landmarks. The Golden Gate Bridge, you can show to anyone in the country or in the world, and they will know where you are. And our other bridges for us are very iconic. The Richmond Bridge, the East Span of the Bay Bridge, the West Span of the Bay Bridge, the Dumbarton Bridge, they all look really distinctive. And then we have um, Mount Tamalpais. So we have all these mountains around, and Mount Diablo, and, and these islands that are quite unique. Angel Island does not look like Red Rock. Um, so it's, we have a really easy time piloting in the Bay Area without a chart. Um, other places you go, especially that are not urban, like Vancouver Island, there's lots of islands out there, and there's very few landmarks. And so oftentimes, You'll, you'll get to your put in, you'll look out there, you know, there's like 18 islands, which is the one that I'm actually heading for. And a compass, having a compass heading is extremely useful. Um, and then that gets you close to the island. And then as you get close, you can look at the details on your chart and start to pick out individual landmarks. But from, you know, from several miles away, it all looks the same. Um, and Thank you. maps are good too. Thank you. That was uh, super. That was super great. I think we're ready to wrap up. So I just want to say thank you to Tom for volunteering his time and putting this all together. I, I mean, I thought this turned out better than I expected. Uh, so, so um, we're really appreciative of your time, and I learned a lot, even though I attended the pre version of this last week. So this was really great for me, and I'm sure everyone else feels the same way. So thank you. Thank you. you. Okay, well, thank you. And. Uh, thank you guys all for coming, and I believe we're going to do at least one more of these. So if you have any thoughts or topics, feel free to 
email me. I'm on Buzz or or and so and on Bask, so you can contact me via that way. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay. You're welcome.